Welcome to the Pixel Retentive Podcast, where we, a business owner and an artist, discuss the business of art and the art of business. Hey friends, I'm Carl, founder of Epic Made. And I'm Ross, creative director at Epic Made, and we're the hosts of the Pixel Retentive Podcast, where we share our thoughts on creativity, art, and business. Past guests include Ian Garlic of Video Case Story, Amanda Russell of Cream Studio, and Lisa Larson Kelly of Quantios. We're forever grateful to the supporters of our podcast, and we're always looking for more sponsors. That said, Epic Made is always brought to you by the creative gurus at Epic. At, sorry, the, <laughs> I'm butchering the whole thing today. <laughs> All right. That said, Pixel Retento is always brought to you by the creative gurus at Epic Made. Epic Made is a team of artists and strategists with a mastery of visual storytelling. Our studio makes unforgettable animation and graphic illustration infused with ideas that put money in your pocket. We best serve marketers and brands seeking to engage nerdy millennials, and some of our favorite clients include Nickelodeon, WWE, and Sci-Fi. Visit GetEpicMade.com and let's collaborate on your next creative campaign. And and we hire people to do voiceovers. <laughs> 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 so, so, so true. What with, with us today we have Stephen Desordo, correct? That's it. Sweet. So, uh, Stephen is a creative leader, accomplished inventor, entrepreneur, rock drummer, and sandwich nerd who has taken a highly untraditional design profession path, leading him and his team into boardroom collaborations with some of the world's leading marketing organizations and globally recognized brands. He invented a wildly successful toy product, the Doodle Top, the top that draws, just out of high school and has sold hundreds of millions of units and earned a rare place in toy history. It's still sold today, I believe, right? Fantastic. Uh, Today, he runs a successful integrated media design studio called Deckhand that serves some of the most exciting technology startups and global enterprises. Welcome, Stephen. Glad to have you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. We finally made it happen. See, we've been doing the dance for a little while. We got you in here. Everything's a going. couple of years of the making. Uh, you guys what, have 250 podcasts under your belt now. Or <laughs> I wish we're getting there one day. But we are at our uh, first. So you know, version you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. All right. So before we jump into today's topic, uh, we want our audience to get to know you a little bit. Uh, so just tell us how long you've been in your industry and the project you're most proud of. Wow. Um, so I started my creative journey years ago, uh, as you mentioned, kind of right out of high school, uh, uh, with the product doodle top, um, currently decade we've been around coming up on about 14 years. Uh, we started purely in presentation design. Uh, and then we've expanded our services to include video, motion, animation, illustration, basically any go-to-market asset the company would need. Uh, we really specialize in tech. Uh, no surprise, our geography out here in California mm-hmm. in the area. Um, and we literally help people build narratives around you know, some really exciting tech project, uh, products and companies. So um, really kind of taking that storytelling skill to the next level and bring a lot more meaning to pretty esoteric topics, right? When you might be talking about, you know, deep technology. Uh, started with digital transformation while well, I didn't barely hear that anymore. Now I'm moving into AI, blockchain, all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, it, it's really exciting because we get to work with some incredible startups. We get to work with some big strategy. We get to see what the big companies are doing and, you know, how they're messaging and marketing and help them along the way. So. Thank you. Love it. Love it. Cool. Um, yeah. So, you know, you just mentioned blockchain. I love blockchain. Like that's been our, my jam. Uh, I would love to hear some more about like what projects and things you guys are getting into on that front. Um, but maybe we should not let me ADD this right out of the gate, Ross. You want to go right into the subject here? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, today we're going to be discussing... <laughs> how to build successful relationships with external design partners to get great results. So basically both Epic Made and Deckhand are very similar in terms of um, services and probably structure to some degree. And so I feel like there's a lot that we can share amongst each other about 
what we feel are the best building blocks for a good relationship with a client, essentially, uh, and a way to teach clients what to expect uh, and maybe how to uh, set themselves up for success when talking with us. Perfect. Yeah. Big so time. Love you start us off, Stephen. What, what do you think are some of the actual problems that we need to solve in, the, in this sort of arena? You know, I think one of the difficulties that a lot of people have is they don't have a, you know, a history and creative background. So you guys probably experience this, right? You're working with oh, yeah. uh, leaders, maybe MBAs, these type, you know, their nomenclature is not consistent with how we think and talk a lot of times. So, uh, you know, scoping uh, is, you know, almost a travesty in a lot of ways. People don't know how to accurately scope. Um, so that puts a big challenge on us as designers to kind of read the room and do a lot of eye reading, uh, to figure out what actually success is going to look like, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of teaching simultaneously while we're trying to kind of map out a project and, uh, education, right. And it's, it's, it's also not just like the vocabulary, uh, that like sometimes clients, uh, don't come to us with that understanding, but it's also what is and isn't important in a project. I think that that's another big one that we have definitely identified over the years is um, a client will come to us and we'll have the same idea of the end product or service, but the way it's structured and like the story behind it and the details basically what they they want those to lend themselves to x and we think it should lend itself to y um it's just a, a difference in opinion of like what should be focused on i think is another big one yeah that's huge you know it's it's you get to the point where it's you know is it a nice to have in this gun or is it critical right um and you know we do a lot of business to business communications right so a little bit different than like a b2c channel and right. paid advertising or whatever um so you know for us it is it's very collaborative um you know we're sort of building the plane as we're flying it uh that happens a lot with uh corporate pitches or big funding pitches ipos uh these set projects where you know you have to uphold like the founder story and the company story and then you got to bring that creative eye to it um and also help that narrative along um, so yeah, people can focus on really funny things. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's mind blowing, you know, and when I think about it specifically in presentation design, right. Uh, these are live files, right? These are not illustrator files. They're not Photoshop files. These aren't after effects files. These are live files and fonts not being loaded correctly. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. That once you hand off a project and it's in the wild, a lot of times we just don't know what's yeah. going to happen. This thing. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thought thing is really funny because, uh, one, it just drives me crazy. Yeah. I imagine, I imagine that's a nightmare, right? Because have, have, making sure that, I mean, even if the, if the, especially if the client isn't particularly tech savvy or design savvy, understanding how that relationship works. Uh, I imagine you could get this whole presentation just proxy fonted in a way that completely resets all of the work that you guys have done. <laughs> yeah. We spent uh, you know, yeah. 10 hours on typography and now it's, you know, comic sans. <laughs> yeah. Thank God that's not the default. I almost want right. to make default. Just it should. Really yeah, just so it looks so bad that people notice it. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Just unintentionally obnoxious. Like this is clearly undesired. Just, just make it wingdings. Make the <laughs> and completely illegible. Uh. Totally. Yeah, we got a project once. Uh, it was for X Prize several years ago. Uh, we handled all the big presentations and uh, we wrapped everything. Was all loaded up. Handed it off to AV. We checked everything. Thought it was fine. You know, everything was great. Went back down to our war room and kind of relaxing with the team because the project's wrapped. Like, I'm just going to go pop up and check out the main stage really quick. I get up and our nice, beautiful typography all defaulted to Times New Roman. So literally the first 
big, bold statement slide look like a headline from the New York Times to me. Like, it didn't even look that good, too, because everything was wrong, right? That's, that's why you gotta, you gotta, um, you just gotta save out PNGs of all the, <laughs> of all the font types or all the, um, uh, the sections and just paste them in there as images instead of it being live text. <laughs> That would be the only way, right? And then you kill all the interactivity of the uh, presentation. So, you know, yeah, it, it's terrifying because so many things can go wrong, right? Yeah. You know, and it's like, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sure. Yeah, just, just you know, deal with the many different platforms, uh, different versions of the software. I mean, there's just so many things that can go wrong. Uh, and we try to mitigate that as much as we can. No matter what we do, it still seems to fall over at times because somebody's not paying attention. So, right. Yeah. So that's, again, just layering into that constant need to educate, uh, you know, in your specific scenario of the specific things you guys are doing, like all the way down to the nuance of like, you have to install these fonts and bring these fonts with these files to every computer. Yeah. That's crazy. You know, and, and back on the glossary thing, you were talking about how we sometimes speak a different language. Um, one of our previous guests, Amanda with Cream Studios, actually we called her out early in the show. Um, they, she's working with a group that's putting together an entire, like, this is a glossary page for non-creatives to all, and even for creatives to get on the same page because motion graphics people might talk about some sort of thing a different way than animators and a different way than illustrators and a different way than the designers. And so like, how do we all get on the same page? So that that's the whole mission behind that. I'll figure out what that link is. I'll get that to you. It's, it's a pretty cool resource. Wow, that's that's great. Yeah, early, early on um, in my career, you know, as I'm working with printers and designers and color separators and, you know, the way we used to do it back in the day, um, I educated myself, right? I went and I found the material. Uh, one of the books that really had an impact on me was uh, Ogilvy and Advertising, a pretty famous book. Um, and that really kind of got me up to speed with the thinking of, you know, how creative plays in advertising and the emotional connection to content. But there was also a great class. So when you go through it, it, it kind of took you through all the stages of how and why the project got to where it is and why it was successful. So um, that book you're mentioning, uh, it can't come out fast enough. And I think, you know, hopefully it's nice and pithy so people sit down and actually read it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big, you'd like you said, Carl, too, you know, animators, illustrators, everybody's kind of have their own kind of language, you know. I think in the creative field, we've all done it long enough. It's easier for us to kind of read and guide those conversations that it might be with a non-creative where we have to really back everything up. Um, yeah, for sure. But I mean, like, uh, just as an example, like an animatic has three different names or a storyboard means something different to uh, a live a live film director or an animator or, you know, like that. there's... There's a lot of interplay even inside of the creative uh, industry that we're all doing kind of similar work, but everyone's in a silo that kind of has developed its own unique dialect of that creative language. Uh, I like a lot of times there are like a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a disconnect, especially with like team leaders, like I'm the creative director for our studio and, um, you know, if if I say something to uh, a collaborator that we're working with, and they're not used to working with me, and they're used, they they hear this word and they think something completely different than what I see in my head. Uh, so th there's a lot of there's a lot of interplay there. I think we can all get on the same page. Uh, that'd be really crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be like an online resource, like almost like a Wikipedia, uh, but for creatives. But, you know, so I'll, I'll definitely. They're working on it now. I'll keep everybody posted on it. <laughs> one, one good example of that is, you know, templates, right? Everybody has a different idea of what an actual template is. Yeah. And oh, yeah. If how it's used and how it's utilized. And, you know, I always say, you know, tell people, you know, templates don't tell stories, right? It's like, get it out of your head. And I learned that early on. Uh, when we were just purely focused on presentation design, um, you know, the how do you correctly build a template that can support, God, that's what, right? 
and how is that used and what are the different we call them toolkits as well like you know that all the all the graphic assets are properly produced for the platform and takes a lot of friction out of design for non-designers right but yeah everybody's like oh we want a template you know and we're like cool so fonts layout color whatever and they're like well it's not really yeah it's not really telling the story and i'm like it's not it's mentally a story it's, yeah. you know, it's the foundation of your house here you know it's got to be built correctly now do whatever you want with the house right so, yeah yeah it's funny uh i think a lot of especially with you know the rise of canva and a, a lot of like more similar resources right there's a lot for video now and things like that where um templates have become a little bit more commonplace and more easily accessible than they were but i think the most effective like if you're truly in this for the art and creativity side and we're trying and you're trying to actually do something unique um like the a, an actual template isn't terribly helpful but I do think that something like uh, like a brand guide, for example, which is a list of things that you should do and shouldn't do within a project is still immensely helpful as a template, right? Where you're... Because um... if you could do anything, then you're, you, have no, you have no constraints and no focus. Like, I think that's what Stephen was saying, too, that like... Yeah that's just a different definition of a template, right? right? Some people think of a template as like, hey, I punch in some words and it's all done already. You know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> versus like what, I think maybe that's more of a guideline or parameters kind of thing, you know, or that, all just splitting those terminologies. So interesting. They they could be, I mean, it, they're really dangerous tools, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. You know, the most powerful design tool that a lot of business people use, right, is PowerPoint, Google Slides, or Keynote, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has access to it. They're not difficult, but, uh, you know, they're dangerous. I mean, if you're not a designer, if you don't really understand visual communication, you can trip over metaphors and cause a lot of problems. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think, you know, back to like our approach, when we look at templates, again, it's really foundational, right? The goal of us as visual designers and visual storytellers is how do we make that experience really sync, right? How do we influence people with our words and images? Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, it just really is because you also work under a lot of constraints. Um, you know, to the topic we were talking about too with, you know, vocabulary and design language. And on that decade, we're, we're a studio. So uh, most people, yeah, Decan have been five plus years uh, tenure uh, at the company. So we can all kind of think for each other. Um, and it also enables us to move really fast, right? Because we're trained up on the brands. Um, in our field and what we deliver for our clients, you know, we're, we're at a pressure cooker, right? A lot of times there are just, there's not enough time to accurately scope things. There's not enough time to have the, the appropriate discussions, right? We just have to go. It's and it's a, it's a challenge. Um, we get it done, but you know, I think because we, we all understand how we work and the clients and what parameters in the environments we're working in or where our content's going to live. Um, we have to look ahead of things, right? You know, back to the fall this situation, right? Um, mods for rot, we were using that for a while, uh, and we found out it was registering different on Firefox versus Chrome. Really? Yeah, it was strange. And now we've got... Uh, I, lo I love Montserrat. I didn't realize I was having that problem. It, it was bizarre. And we, 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 it, it kind of surfaced and it, it, it wasn't a big problem. And then we just looked at it across a bunch of different browsers. And that was, you know, actually looking at like a slides document um, per se and not obviously a locked up. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was just driving me crazy just how stuff was rendering. Um, and, you know, it also kind of comes and goes, right? There might be a platform update or something, and you might see this with uh, um, maybe a Squarespace website, things like that. Right? Um, so you kind of have to constantly check things. But, you know, and these days, too, um, 
you know, specifically in the field of presentation design, um, a lot of brand guides don't address the issue of open source thoughts, right? So, you know, we, a lot of times have to go, Hey, that's great. Love the brand guide. These thoughts are not going to work for a big part of your activation. Um, so we're constantly, we're going to look at stuff in different browsers. We're going to beat it up as much as we can, run it cross platform forwards and backwards through PowerPoint or slides, um, and identify where those problems are. So, so there's a lot of problem solving, right? With yeah. technology that we all, I know you guys probably have to deal with that all the time, right? Um, and stay on top of that, right? Um, yeah, I've said it, I've said it before. I mean, obviously the part of what you're talking about is technical problem solving, right? Uh, but in general, cre that's all creativity is as well, right? It, it, creativity is just problem solving. You just, the, um, and that's why, that's why having constraints on creativity is helpful because like a lot of clients will come to you and say, Hey, well, we just want something and then insert generic adjective here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right. Well, we want something awesome or epic or whatever. And that's the only parameters that they'll give without being, you know, teeth pulled. Right. And I think that most of the time it's from a, it's coming from a good place. It's coming from, oh, we want you to feel comfortable being creative because you're, you guys are creative artsy types and you just want complete and utter freedom. Right. Um, not realizing that if you, if, if you just allow someone to stare at a blank page who is an artsy creative type, they will just, the blank page will just sit there. Like it will, you won't know what to do because you can do anything. Um, Gotta have some direction. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think that just coming to the table with, even if it's a bad idea, right? Like coming to the table with an idea, some sort of constraint that we can then manipulate and mold and try to figure out, okay, where are the goods, the bads and the uglies out of this thing, I think is incredibly helpful. Um, and you mentioned something, Steven, um, going back to sort of the timeline situation, right? Where you said you don't really have a ton of time to do any project. Like what are some of the conversations you're having with clients to try to set their expectations there? Cause obviously we, you know, we run into the problem as well, where, a client comes and they're like, Hey, we need this yesterday. Um, you know, I'm willing to pay whatever, but like, what are we looking at as far as timeline is concerned? Like, what, what are some of the things that, what other kind of discussions do you have? Yeah. I mean, that's something we try to get ahead of. If it's, you know, every project's obviously different. Uh, if it's an event driven project, uh, we know there's a real definitive time. Well, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's funny because when I think of timeline, I think of process, right? So, uh, I, I always find it really curious and, and, and this is, this is something where we have to address. I mean, we're actively trying to build new processes so our clients understand, you know, what those impacts will be on timelines or budget. Right. But, you know, it, it's almost comedy to me because people will come to us and we'll be like, Hey, what's your process? We really want to understand it. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, at kickoff, boom, they completely abandon all process, right? So what we have to do then is kind of rescope and retool, you know, how is this process going to work, right? So, in, and a lot of times it's just kind of managing chaos, you know, a good example, um, you guys are probably confronted with this quite a bit, and I know a lot of designers are, right? Let's say you have a, a meeting cadence of a couple couple days a week, right? Checking on reviews, whatever. All of a sudden somebody says, Hey, we want daily check-ins, right? Mm -hmm. What that does, that equates to daily deliverables, yeah. right? So you have to almost dedicate one or two team members specifically for that project, even though that wasn't like research that way at scope, right? So, um, we are building a lot of, we have our internal process of our tools and, you know, we've been doing it forever. So, uh, we have very specific processes of how we move through projects, getting clients into that headspace is just a challenge. Everybody's operating differently. 
uh, now throw remote work and async work in there. Uh, and it's a challenge, right? So, um, I think a lot of people that, you know, move into, let's say, creative management positions. And, and you see this a lot right in our field where creative directors are really kind of managers, right? But we didn't go to management school, you know, we came out of creative, right? So, um, and so, you know, conversely, where clients might not have our kind of same vocabulary and nomenclature, creative directors also don't necessarily have that business understanding. Uh, so, you know, I think it doesn't necessarily put people at odds, but it can cause a lot of friction through a design process and can really influence, you know, budget. It's extremely right. So you can, let's say you just take that meeting cadence from twice a week to, to every day, right? You just two X your meeting allocation, right? And because now we assume there is going to be a deliverable every day. Yeah. Right? You're going to have something to talk about. Otherwise there's no reason to have a meeting. So exactly. Yeah. So I mean, right there, you know, that's one of the first things we look at, um, and we, you know, we'll try to benchmark things, but again, because of time compression, uh, you know, we don't have that luxury in, in specifically kind of our core practice when we're looking at, you know, presentation design, visual narrative, storytelling, um, you know, if that happens in film and video, right. You've, you've, then we've seen this before. Hey, it's an hour long show. People want to basically see a cut every day. Right. We've got four hours of render time. You know, hey, right. And so, or yeah. warrant if it's a, if it's a fully, right. it's, yeah. I mean, so it's, and I think, you know, clearly articulating that with clients, you know, how that impacts timeline, how that can impact the process and what that's going to, how that's going to correlate to budget, um, is, is important. It's a really important and it's our job, right. As, as designers and managing these processes to bring that up to the client. Yeah help them make those decisions. Do you really want this? Or is that a nice, tap? right? So and that, and that's difficult. That's, that's. Yeah. Cause you're always trying to close the deal at that point as well. So you're trying to say like, Hey, basically you're not going to get everything you want, but you're going to get everything you need to do the job. Right. So like, how do you have that conversation while also, but like, we would, we would like to have your business. We're the right fit, you know? So. I guess it's no one else is going to be able to do it better, right? Like that, that's the pitch. It's yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it's always a challenge, um, you know. And then higher up in an org, you work, right? Let's say we're working with C-suite. They don't care about timelines and budget. It's like get it, done, right? So, but money doesn't solve the problem. That's like right. great. You can throw money at me. That's not necessarily going to solve the problem. So, you know, I'm a little reticent to de- even agree to that, although we, we get it done a lot of times. We're like, oh, don't worry about budget. You know, we'll find that. But, you know, that puts us in a low comfortable place, right? Totally. Let's, let's say you're revving and you're throwing away a lot of work because there's a lot of pivots and narrative or whatever. You know, at the end of the day, you look at it, you're like, really? That doesn't happen. But you, you quickly, a lot of people have amnesia as soon as a project closes, right? Like, hey, great, right? You're like, oh, yeah, did you remember everything we get that done? Um, and, you know, so again, I think, you know, constantly keeping that open communication with your client, this goes both ways. Clients need to keep that open line with their creative partners as well. Um, so we both have a responsibility to effectively manage the project. Um, it, it, so- it, uh, it hurts morale too when a project, uh like the people working on the project don't necessarily feel the benefit of oh this c-suite guy is throwing money at you right and so progressively as they have to pivot their ideas and rework stuff that they just spent the last 10 hours working on you know they get slower at it and they care less over time, depending on how, you know, like it, it, it compounds, right? Like it's not a oh, one revision and you throw the, the, you know, the sink out, but like, if you're getting just pelted with, Hey, you know, actually we changed our mind. Don't do this. 
do this instead. Hey, actually, we're just going to like rip this scene out. Uh, hopefully that doesn't mess up the continuity of the other scenes <laughs> before me. Uh, you know, it's it becomes really daunting over time to constantly have to make these changes because we as creatives um, sort of by default, I feel like have to put some of ourselves in it, right? Like we have to put skin in the game, even if it's something that we're not super behind personally. I mean, it's the only uh, way it gets really good is for you to it's really the only way care about it. Good, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and so to to have sort of the artistic vision that you've come up with, you know, nitpicked or picked apart over and over and over again, uh, I think that also affects timeline. And I don't know that clients really understand that as well. Yeah, um, that an interesting return. You no, know, exactly. I mean, and that's a great point. You know, that that brings up, I was talking with my team this morning in our meeting and just about some topics we should cover, right? Um, um, you know, another impact on that timeline and when you're collaborating wider groups of people, especially async type work is who are the stakeholders, right? Like sometimes we're working, you know, ideally you have one point of contact that's filtering through that on the client side. They're taking the feedback, making sense of it. Next thing you know, we might show up and there's four new people mm -hmm. in, all, in the project, right? That all have a different. I love that. I love when that happens. <laughs> yeah, right? So, so then you're you're you know, in some cases, they haven't seen the process or how we even got to where we are today. Um, and then you got to be really careful that you're not doing duplicative work, right? So, we never throw away anything. Yeah, when we do a project, you know, it could be, let's say if we're just talking slide camp, you know, it could be runtime if we're talking video or motion, right? But, you know, there might be 30 slides, but there are 150 different revs behind that, right? So, um, and that's picking up narrative changes, um, you know, different brand language then like flow through. But a lot of times we, because we work in tech, we would do a lot of work in tech. Seems like tech companies are rebranding every six months, right? So, uh, good, good for us, right? But uh, we often get put pushed into branding exercises because we're working on super high value content, right? That's going to be distributed wide. Uh, right. So, a lot of times, you know, if we're activating a brand, per se, um, you know, the the big brand agencies aren't necessarily thinking about all the different digital activation. Uh, this have to happen with this and some things just don't work right you have to you, you, just not everything in a brand guy waterfalls and fits neatly uh to do visual storytelling right sure so you know there's a lot of nuance that that has to happen to really bring that to life um and then you get into you know a lot of other things like you were talking about nitpicking things and you know, now accessibility is a big issue. Uh, always been a, a huge proponent of that. Um, one, because I'm colorblind. Uh, so uh, I see I see things a little differently than other people, um, but it's good, right? Because high contrast, um, those variables are really important, right? So- um, And, they, and they, they benefit design objectively. Yeah. Right? Increased contrast is never going to be a huge problem in design. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. you want that. I mean, it should be bold. It should stand out and should be legible. Um, you also, you know, think about any digital media, right? It's going to render different on every screen. You know, projection versus LED walls. Uh, we we often find uh, when well, we used to do a lot of work internally with companies or sort of. Remember back in the day, we'd all go down in meeting rooms and all that fun stuff. Uh, we would recalibrate all the monitors in our clients' offices. Oh, wow. wow. They weren't set correctly, right? They just pull them out of the box. They were set for HD. Right. And that, it was like, why does our blue look like that? And I'm like, it's exactly your hex code out of your brand guy. Right. What, give me the remote. Please look at your settings, right? <laughs> so, uh, so you want to be conscious of that too, like with with certain, you know, the old color washes and things. Like, there's some things you just kind of want to stay away from. Um, some blues have a really hard 
gamma situation going on in different environments, right? Um, so you want to you want to hear a funny story? Yeah. Um, I uh, so I I kind of ran into this issue on my own, right? Where so like my I have two monitors, and neither one of them renders perfectly alike to one another, right? Like I don't think there's a way to make it. They're from two different companies. I don't think there's a way to make it happen. But um, I would I would draw something on one monitor, check it over on the other one, and so on and so forth. And then when I pulled it up on my phone, it looked totally different. And I have no idea. I had no idea why, right? Um, and I went back and forth for like days trying to figure out why this was happening. Only to realize that on my phone, I constantly keep the blue light filter on. So <laughs> my, my, whole, my whole phone is tinted yellow so that, yeah, you know, my, my eyes don't burn out of my fucking skull. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> uh, and so I was looking at, I was looking at this, the, this, uh, this image and all the blues were really like messed up and all the golds and yellows on that were really like saturated. And I was like, I mean, it's, it looks okay, but it doesn't look at all like what is on these other two screens. And I could not for the life of me figure out why. Well, it was so, a like, frustrating thing. Yeah. Then, then, so there's all sorts of stuff. Just to your point, like there's all sorts of stuff that even I'm like I do that I've done this for professionally since 2013, right? Like it, it, for over a decade at this point, point. Um, and I that wasn't that long ago, you know, a couple of years maybe. <laughs> so like, this is one of those things that even professionals can get messed up if if they're not expecting to see the problem. Um, and if you take someone who's not used to judging creative or not used to assessing this sort of stuff and they're in, you know, their office or their, their home laptop or whatever, and they have a, a setting off or something like that. And then they bring a, um, a revision up to you that may not even exist on your side of the table. Uh, you know, making sure that we understand exactly why something is being changed and what, like the root of it, as opposed to just, okay, you want this to be a different blue. Let's just do that. Um, I think that's also super important. Yeah, that is because, you know, in it's almost impossible to yeah. address it. I mean, you, you live in the eye by your hex codes, whenever you don't see them like, Hey, that that's, that's your source of truth. Right. Um, if things are going to render kind of egregiously bad or we see that, we bring that up, um, that tends to go to the brand police. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes like, no, it has to be like that. We're like, okay, you no, know, just, just <laughs> call that out. Like, we're, we're going to see this. Be problem. We had it happen at an event. Uh, one of the first events when it came back, uh, back in person stuff. And uh, we knew there was a blue that, it was an issue. Uh, we, I think it was, it was projection or LED. I forget what it was, but we handed off to the, to, to the AV team. They had a hard time. Uh, um, the, you know, get, get, I guess it was LED. That's right. So they were having a hard time getting the blue to render correctly. Right. So we had to do a lot of tweaking in the back end of the actual file. At the end of the day, they chose to get, Closer to brand blue for the sake of the resolution of the content, right? So I show up day of the show. I was like, oh no, I saw the screen. I'm like, we said explicitly don't do that. And I see all the content, you know, it's just derans. It just didn't look good, right? And, and, you, you know, after that, we kind of had to post more on. We said, well, why was that decision made? You know, the audience would not care about uh, the it. resolution. The resolution was decreased to adjust for the color. Yeah, there was, it was, it was, it, I forget exactly what the problem was. Well, one of the problems was uh, the team showed up and there was still a, a disk drive in the show machine. <laughs> uh, so I was like, I haven't seen a, a MacBook like that in a long time. All right. Oh. Somewhere in my storage, uh, immediately kind of a red flag. So, you know, it's it's just again kind of that point where say look, so many things can go wrong 
right? And, then, you know, unless you're explicitly running the show and handling that, you know, a lot of times we're handling that stuff off, right? When we're done. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, this always a, always a challenge, no doubt. Um, yeah, I think the overarching thing here really always is like setting expectations, communicating your expectations, seeing if those align with your clients or if the client's hiring you, whatever direction that's going, uh, over communicating in any relationship. At least that's what my wife has taught me the past 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too. I and mean, I'm, I'm a total you know, communication nerd. Uh, Carly, Carly, you've probably seen how short my email replies are. I'm They're kind of a three sentences and out. Um, right. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's, everybody's really busy, right? So you, you can't send somebody. I mean, if you send me three paragraphs, I'm going to table that till, you know, I'm laying in bed if I'm still working. Um, it's just going to be too much for me to process. So, um, you know, really be clear and crisp with those communications, being meaningful with, um, uh, not opening up too many questions, right. Uh, just getting to what you need sooner um, to move projects forward. And, you know, that again is because that time compression, right? Uh, you just don't have a lot of time. But if, you know, if things are, you know, we would have <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. Uh, go the way back machine. Let's say uh, there was a big initiative by a very, very large, well known credit card processor. Uh, and we were working with an agency and uh, they wanted to do this big release. They were going to hand all their sales reps iPads. They were a PC org, right? So they wanted these live files. They can manage a PC. They were going to push it to iPads, right? Uh, this is fairly early in the iPad game. I think it was like V1 or 2 or something, right? So, you know, how you just moved content onto the iPad was a challenge. Right, to scale it, right? Yeah. So we knew there were two big releases coming out, the update in PowerPoint and an update in iOS, right? Mm. Or iPad. We did a bunch of stress testing. We were like, this is not going to work. This design approach will not work. And went to the agency, you know, I jumped up and down every single meeting. I'm like, you guys, it's not going to work. We're like, do it. We're the creative director. We're the agency. That's what they want. They're like, okay, but let me warn you. It, it's not going to work, right? So they go to distribute it. The agency comes back, goes, it's not working. Shocker. <laughs> I was like, gee, really? Huh? I think we talked about that, right? So, uh, um, And then, know. of course, everyone has amnesia about talking. Yeah. You no, know, exactly. So that, you know, then they come back and they're like, well, why is it going to cost more? I'm like, because we have to redo it now. You know, you forced us down this path. We said that's not going to work. Warning, warning, warning. I think these releases came out like two days before this initiative was going to go live. I mean, we basically had to re redo the work, you know, and it, 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 the relationship suffered uh, with that agency in charge. Yeah. The project did work. Uh, it was successful, but it was just painful for no reason. Right. Right? And I always like to, you know, when we're pitching or um, discussing colleagues, right? You really want to pick your your partnerships, you know, well and, and be explicit. Like, what are we trying to achieve with this relationship, right? So um, one of the reasons Deckhand has expanded services to deal with a lot of different marketing initiatives is because we kind of got forced into it. You know, is that we work with high growth clients, right? Massive tech companies. Yeah from zero to a million uh or billions whatever talk money um yeah. you know there's just not a lot of time you're building the plane you're flying right so um what we've learned over the years to build in a lot of efficiency do all the production correctly build the asset libraries correctly get the foundation set and once it's set i mean we can just move with that the amount of content that we produce in one week is just mind-blowing. I mean, I, I just, it's shocking. Um, and that's just because we, we get requests, you know, I think uh, earlier this week, oh yeah, we got nothing for you this week. 15 projects come in the next day. 
from that yep. place. Oh, we need a double of the MVP. You know, so and it's fine. In this particular client, it's great. They actually have a really strong design operation process. They have a single point of contact. Uh, we've got a, an efficient Slack channel going. Everybody's on board, right? So we can do it, right? We're like, yeah, no problem. 15 projects, we got you. You know, a lot of times people are like, oh my God, how do you do it so fast? It's like, because we built that relationship that we're seeing, that cadence that, right. you know, I mean, that's the relationship. We're going to help you with all these initiatives, no matter what they are. Um, you know, it's a lot different than doing kind of bespoke one-offs, right? Um, and it's one of the things I think is really kind of underpin our, it's our success over the years is this one, having a tight group, right? We've all worked together for a long time. Uh, we all have different perspectives, different skill sets, but we do have this kind of through line in our process. So the consistency and continuity is, is huge, right? right. Uh, so it's, you know, it's when the relationships are really, you know, dialed and working well, uh, those efficiencies are directly correlated with costs, right? You're going to typically see probably your costs go down the longer relationship is right. in those flights, right? Uh, now that's, you know, that's why you kind of like choose your partner wisely, right? So um, we all know, right? There's, the, you know, disparate skill sets, right? In our fields are, oh, cool. I'm an animator. Ooh, really? You got to, did you go to school for that? You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, right. and you could tell right away just because you know how to use a animation tool doesn't mean you're an animator, right? So I run, I run into that all the time. We're going to see this on an exponential level as AI continues to explode. Like, just because you can render some shit out doesn't mean you're an artist. Like, mm -hmm. doesn't mean you're an animator. Doesn't mean you're a designer, a photographer, right? Like, you got an Instagram page. You're not a photographer, probably. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's very true, you know, and, you know, I think we see that it, it's interesting our team. A lot of people are kind of blown away when they come in to deckhand because they're like, wow, how do you guys do this? Uh, we have a creative director that was at big agencies uh, for years that we brought in a couple of years ago. Um, nobody at deckhand has traditional agency experience. I think that's why a lot of our clients like working with us because uh, they don't really put on shiny bullshit, right? right yeah. we, we get it done. No but, shiny uh, bullshit. No shady bullshit. Um, but our creative director was just blown away. He's like, I can't believe how much of your content is makes it, you know, out in the wild. You know, it's it's by order probably ninety eight percent, right? Whereas when you're working with big brand initiatives, right? Right. You might never see the hand day, right? Um, or a lot of it gets shelved. A lot of it gets shelved. Uh, I'm always shocked too when I, you know, somebody comes in and they start kicking tires on budget. And you're like, wait, how much did you spend on that the logo refresh? I think yeah. I heard a million dollars, but I can't really tell the difference. So, well, you know, uh, it, it just it, it kind of blows me away. But, um, you know, I, I think it was one of the things that I really appreciate about the work we do is that it does see a lot of debt, uh, a lot of it. Um, and you know, the frequency and the consistency and the continuity of us working on these projects and these more effectively managed relationships, um, people really see the impact of that. Um, and, uh, you know, again, when I talk to clients that are particular, let's say marketing org, that's experienced at high growth or maybe there's some attrition on the team or their layoffs. You know, do you want to go manage four different agencies to kind of get one thing done? Or do you want to put a strategy in place where one of your partners can handle, you know, X, Y, and C part of the project and you're moving it towards a common goal, right? So, um, and we have to be real particular to, um, you know, we, then this certainly is true for the presentation aspect, right? Our those are all source files, right? So mm -hmm. when we send those out, God knows where they end up, right? So right. Um, and we've seen this in the past with clients where something was like a B1 rev. We sent it out. I'll see that maybe it's a platform diagram or something we were working on that 
those can go on forever. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll be at a show and I'm like, that, where'd you get that graphic? That's, that's not correct. Yeah. That's not the one that's supposed to be in there. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, and this is scaling out to thousands of people in an org, right? So once it goes out, you know, it's so, really hard to claw back. I mean, it's just almost impossible in a lot of, a lot of ways. So, um, you know, really being mindful of those details and correctly producing things that one live under, you know, in these parameters we talked about, right. And, uh, and they're going to stand up and be successful in most, I'm going to say most environments because you can't guarantee it all as we covered. <laughs> So, man, uh, Stephen, we are coming up on time, but before we wrap, uh, we do have one last question for you. Is there anyone or anything in your career that you'd like to shout out to the audience? Uh, maybe a mentor, valuable resource, favorite client. We we just like to have uh, our guests kind of share the love after uh, being on the podcast. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think some of my biggest inspiration is Charles and Ray Ames work. Uh, I just love the story. Actually, a good friend of mine is curating uh, an exhibit here in Richmond. Uh, I think yeah. one of the founders of Airbnb uh, is financing it. Um, so I get I get a kind of a behind the scenes tour, old stuff in the warehouse. Yeah, um, but also you know, uh, what just the you know how they their creative approach and you know they started the career later in life. I mean, I think Charles finally got that chair to market when he was 52 or three. Um, oh, wow. And then they, they essentially kind of became a presentation of visual communication design for, right, with all that work for the IBM. Uh, he was also obsessed with tops and filmmaking. Uh, I wish he was alive when Doodle Top came out, I'm sure. Yeah, let's say. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of a callback correlation there. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I, I've been really lucky. I've, I've, I've got, you know, over the course of my career, you know, I have mentors in both kind of the toy design, industrial design world. Um, a good friend of mine that I partnered with, uh, Stapley Hildebrand, Aaron Stapley, went to high school together. It's a package design for here in the city. Um, uh, another advisor, we have Ian Coates McCall. He is a professor at CCA. Uh, he was instrumental in us launching that product there, Kuba, which is that version is not on the market anymore, but we have another version on the market. Uh, you know, helped us put us in touch with manufacturers, um, helped guide us through. Uh, and then I've got professional mentors as well. Uh, I always hit the SCORE organization, if you guys are familiar with SCORE. Uh, a great resource, certainly for entrepreneurs, um, but really anybody, uh, because they cover a lot of different topics. It can just be finance, management, marketing. You know, these are usually experts in the field. Um, but I've been been really lucky, uh, and I'm an extreme collaborator. I mean, I the list would go on and on and on. Uh, I do my best work in collaborative environments, um, and I, I, I have to. Uh, it's just how my brain thinks. Um, you know, ADD and all that good fun stuff, right? It's kind of like yeah, 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 you know, swirl around, you know. But um, which I it's kind of a superpower, right? Because I can get to places really fast, but Absolutely. I can also over rotate, right. If, if I'm pushing, 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 pushing. Right. So, um, it's so the vibes that I've had and these people, you know, really helped me kind of look at process, look at teams, look at organizing, um, you know, and also just share ideas. Um, another good friend of mine, uh, evil eye studios, um, evil eye films, uh, do a lot of work for Epic. Um, they're working in a real engine a lot. Uh, uh, Dan Rosen and uh, his partners have been instrumental. I mean, we share a lot of ideas, uh, and they do crazy work. I mean, they, they started their, oh, yeah. they did the matrix. They did, you know, well, the CG work for the matrix. So, um, yeah, just a ton of people. I mean, I have business advisors. I mean, it goes on and on, but Absolutely. you know, the conversations Carl, you and I have, I mean, it's, yeah. As infrequent as they are, uh, they're always great. Uh, Absolutely. But uh, yeah, and a lot of, you know, we, we, we have a lot of, you know, successful CMOs and C-suite people that have brought us along for the ride um, to a variety of different companies and that we built that trust over the years. And, you know, it's really rewarding for me 
when we have these constant repeat clients. A lot of our clients we've had for, you know, coming up on decades in some cases. So that, that's really rare too. Super yeah. Rare. It's, you know, and it's, I think it's, you know, the way I've built a company and the team here, you know, we all have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. We all know that we work in these really kind of pressure cooker environments. Um, and then, you know, we really had a, a strong work life balance. Um, we work nine to five. We rarely do weekends. Like we, that's it. We, that's all you can get out of us during the day, right? If we so choose to get inspired late night, which happens to me all the time, so be it. But as far as really kind of maximizing the creative energy, the spirit of get stuff done consistently, you know, I think building the right team and having the right people on the bench to get it done is critical. I love that. I love that. All right, Stephen. Well, I also want to give a big thank you to Julie Annixter for connecting us all those years ago. Uh, Julie, I to mention her. Oh my God, sorry, Julie. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, you know, she uh, she introduced us back when I knew her uh, when she was previously the executive director for uh, AIGA National. So, yeah, no, yeah, she, man. Well, she was great. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Julie. I haven't talked to her in a while. I met her at uh, the AIGA uh, uh, Yale program. Oh, nice. Uh, and uh we 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 hit it off immediately uh that was great we got to work on some aiga stuff too for them uh you know back when she was still on ed up there um those beautiful offices they used to have in the war war building in new york uh, yeah yeah oh yeah but uh, well, yeah, she's, she's a powerhouse oh yeah, yeah. we have been talking with steven desordo who is the ceo of deckhand you can check out the website at www.deckhand.media and not dot com. Uh, uh, but if uh, if listeners want to follow up with you directly, Stephen, uh, where should they go? Uh, they can just hit me up on my email. Uh, it's Stephen, S T E P H E N, at the deckhand uh, That was our old URL. And it's flat because everybody calls us deckhands. Uh, we're deck and, it was deck and San Francisco. Yeah. So, <laughs> but there, you know, switch it to a whole new email. And that'll happen probably in 10 years. Uh, I am. We've done the dance a few times ourselves. So, all right. Hey. Thanks so much for being on the show. And, uh, until next time, everybody, we appreciate you guys checking us out. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. You guys do awesome work. Thanks, man. So, yeah. Thanks. We really hope you enjoyed the show. Please like and subscribe to join us on our next journey through the world of art and business on the Pixel Retentive Podcast. (laughs) 